just a boy from Kansas out to save the world from chronic diseases. And I truly mean that. Nobody is in control of your health but you. I can't heal you. Your doctor can't heal you. You have to heal you. And it's all about having the education empowerment to know what you need to be changing within yourself, within your life, to set your soul free and accomplish that best life that we all like to talk about. And I truly believe that the greatest medicine of all is to teach people how not to need it. I'm Brendan Vermeyer, the original Holistic Savage. Welcome to the Holistic Savage Podcast. All right. So, Dr. Deep, Sandeep Gupta, welcome to the Holistic Savage Podcast, where we like to talk about all things related to functional medicine, functional fitness, functional spirituality, and functional psychology, kind of the, the subjects, the pillars. You know, I'm just a boy from Kansas out to save the world from chronic disease, and I like to think that the great Smith Smalls teach people how not to need it, and uh, I'm super excited to have you on because you are definitely... Uh, somebody that I've looked up to a lot with my career in regards to functional medicine and your critical thinking with your expertise on, I mean, just about everything, but I know you're, you're a big mold guy and you're kind of the first one that exposed me to uh, mold illness. So I'm sure we'll nerd out, but how have you been, man? It's been a while. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Look, I, things are always updating in my world and, uh, uh, it's been pretty pretty amazing this last year, just looking into into some of the new insights which have come out around mold illness and functional medicine in general. And uh, actually, last week I was in Denver, Colorado, and saw really a, a whole showpiecing of the new insights in functional medicine which came out, and, and it was so exciting. It was, it was really cool. Yeah. So looking forward to talking about it in a bit more depth. Absolutely. You know, I originally I was supposed to go to that conference in Denver. Uh, and, you know, I, I wish I could be in two places at once, but I ended up going to the uh, microbiome keynotes out in California. But I, I know uh, my friend Emily spoke about oxalates at the uh, yeah. uh, Denver conference. She's she's a smart right. cookie, that yeah. one. I'm sure she'll be on the show. Right. Yeah, I, know, I didn't know you knew. Yeah, that's right. I didn't know you knew her. Well, we're actually going to be probably writing a review paper together on oxalates and intravenous vitamin C, um, which we're going to be publishing that early next year in a, a journal called Nutrients, which is having a special um, edition on intravenous vitamin C. So, yeah, there were some cool pieces that came together that weekend, and Bob Miller and Evely Gibbler and Beth O'Hara and all the other members of that team had a lot of really interesting pieces and and one of the most cool things was that they brought it together in the form of a map mm. uh, which really gave someone a way of understanding how everything f you know fitted together and the the key thing was around this idea of nadph getting affected by by an environmental toxins and i think that was a really good center point for that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i was at the uh, the ici conference in Arizona back in like May and you know Bob it was a lot of the same people Neil and Bob Miller and um, but yeah Emily's awesome you know I met her through uh, Michael's mentorship program and um, super smart oh, okay. but that's right, right, right. Super, yeah yeah now yeah. oh, we're all connected somehow <laughs> yeah um, that's right very good very good so you know with I mean we might as well just kind of jump into some of this mold stuff because um you know, I think the environmental acquired illness and environmental toxicants and the mold, you know, we're just kind of seeing these more complex, multifaceted uh, cases. And, you know, some of the man work that Bob Miller's doing, um, I watched one of his mitochondria presentations and cell danger response. It's just like some next level stuff. Um, but yeah, let's, let's hash out. So mold illness. Hey, you know. let's, let's, put the, let's put the Godfather on here for oh, a second. Oh, hey. hey. Is that real? Put yourself in the film. Yeah. <laughs> Tim, here Reed. he is, the man himself. <laughs> uh, there he is. <laughs> You're on him. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, we got to get him on. I was just in a meeting with him an hour ago. So hash out okay, F man. FDN level two in that curriculum. That'll be a good time. Yeah. Ah, uh, awesome. So you were uh, saying the other day on uh, Facebook, you know, so, you know, mold illness, I think we're just now kind of starting to get traction and starting to gain a, a little bit more awareness. But, you know, of course, too, 
uh, you know, uh, Dr. Schumacher, Shoemaker, however you like to pronounce that, um, you know, kind of being a pioneer in that field. I know, you know, you were certified through him. But then now I feel like we're so much kind of beyond that. And there's new information coming out every day as we're learning more about how these mycotoxins really just hijack everything about our physiology. So what are some new findings in your world that you're digging into? Yeah, man. Yeah, well, I, look, I think the biggest thing that, that didn't come up in the original model of, of CIRS and, and mold was the idea of mold colonization mm -hmm. uh, in the body. Mm -hmm. And really, that, that is a big missing piece. Mm -hmm. And I think you spoke about that in your recent podcast as well. But, you know, when you start getting massive mold colonization, it, you know, it affects the gut majorly, can affect the lungs and sinuses. And then one of the things that came out of the Denver conference is that when you then start getting a large amount of oxalates being formed, Mm -hmm. then you can easily get um, mast cell problems and mm -hmm. you can get all of the metabolic problems that come from uh, from oxalates themselves. And so, uh, you know, that it really is an important piece of it is looking at that, you know, mold itself colonizing the body or fungus colonizing the body, uh, whether it be the nasal passages or whatever. And, um, yeah, that can, that can really, really mess things up. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think you're right. I don't. I, you know, I uh, never really see a ton of people talking about the the colonization. And so I recently made like a mold illness cheat sheet thing just to, you know, do my part to try to get the info out there. Of like, all right, step one, environment and exposure. Step two, you know, we've got to be determining the colonization, you know, whether it's, a, you know, the sinuses and then you're colonizing in the gut. But even too, you see these uh, different images and stuff of like breast implants or hip implants with like mold growing on it. So I think we have to be cognizant of that systemic uh, growth yes. and colonization. Yeah. And with, you know, mold being able to directly produce oxalates and then candida uh, kind of indirectly contributing to the oxalate burden. Um, I think, yeah, there, there's got to be a lot to that. Otherwise we're, you know, trying to constantly detox and it's like we're, um, you know, trying to bail water out of a sinking ship. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good analogy, and you know, it's 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 basically getting to the causes is going to be the the key thing in 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 any illness, really. But I mean, mold illness particularly, and you know, the, of course, the detoxification and using the binders and so on is is super important. But we've got to find out where what's actually causing the the mycotoxins and other compounds to get into our body, and and one of the key causes, of course, as as for, Dr. Shoemaker is the building that we're living in or working in or driving in mm -hmm. um, or even just visiting. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the, you know, you oh, know, if, so if, if, we're, if we've got a massively water damaged building, then, then that's definitely going to be creating all sorts of microbial compounds and so on, which are, are going to get into the body. And so that's one of the key things to address first. But if we address that and we don't look at mold and fungal mm -hmm. colonization in the body, we still have only got halfway there because that that's also going to be creating toxic byproducts, which are going to affect us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, and so it, it seems, you know, one of the, the primary or kind of like where it starts is, okay, you know, we're in, in a, you know, any environment that might be growing a little bit of toxigenic mold, uh, breathing in all these bio aerosols, the, the VOCs and the uh, different gram negative bacteria. And, you know, I think, the I'm curious your your thoughts on like the biofilm status and marcons because it seems like a lot of times you know if if we've got mold colonized in the gut or, or systemically or whatever you know that sinus passage or the respiratory tract or you know you hear about people growing aspergillus in their lungs and everything um, mm -hmm. some of the different antifungals like diflucan or whatever we might have to use to mm -hmm. eradicate mm -hmm. like that, that you know then before kind of getting into all the binders and detox side of things as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I think that's another really important point you know, is, is biofilm. So it's not just it's not just fungus. It's, it's the presence of biofilms. And often there are other organisms such as um, dysbiotic bacteria mm -hmm. and parasites, et cetera, which are, are part of the feature and, and part of the puzzle, if you like. In, in, in a patient with CIRS. Mm -hmm. And so one of the key, I think one of the keys that's come up over the last six to 12 months is, is to think of the nasal 
um, the nasal biome as being a, a delicate balance, similar to mm -hmm. the, the GI microbiome. And yes, Marcon's is important, but no, Marcon's is not the only thing. Mm -hmm. You know, there's all sorts of dysbiotic organisms that are there. And, and probably the original research group were quite focused just on that Marcon's as a singular organism and, and eradicating it at all costs. But now I think that the emphasis has shifted towards, you know, okay, so there's some Marcon's in there. Maybe there's also some Pseudomonas. Maybe there's some fungus as well. Let's, you know, let's use something just, you know, general, like some silver and some biocide and mm -hmm. et cetera, to just knock this load down. And even if we haven't 100% got rid of Marcon's, or even if there's a little bit of Sunamoda still there, let's start repopulating with some nasal probiotics mm. and, and so on. And, and, you know, and try and get, get the balance right, just like we do with the, the gastrointestinal microbiome. Mm hmm yeah, the sinuses, you know, it's a, the fun thing about functional medicine as an industry is obviously there's so much sensationalism and some bandwagon stuff. You know, there's there's that side of it versus like, all right, let's really try to like advance our understanding yeah. here rather than just what's the hot topic. You know, it, it amazes me how many people now are saying, you know, everything is mast cell activation. Oh, yeah, definitely a little MCAS going on. It's like, shut up. Like, <laughs> um, I don't know. It, it gets a, a little bit silly, yeah. but I'm sure we are going to start yeah. seeing more and more about the sinuses or like the oral cavity as well. And, you know, you mentioned biocide, and I am proud to say I, I do some clinical education for biobotanical. Bio We're going to be releasing our nasal spray here pretty soon because I've been. Have yeah, they mentioned that neti pot for a while. <laughs> yeah, they actually did mention that at the conference in Denver that they're going to be bringing that out. They gave a little talk there, so I think that's going to be really useful. And I think they have developed a a combination of herbs, which is quite broad spectrum and useful for a number of different microbial overgrowths. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're doing some some interesting research, and I know there's a lot more to come. And I'm trying to, you know get involved with some of that even more um because it is interesting you know some of the different properties we're seeing with it but you know the a lot of it centers around that biofilm because you kind of start looking in this biofilm stuff and it's like all right well you know we've got all sorts of critters hiding in the biofilm but also you know with like the oxalates that you mentioned um you know being that powerful anti-nutrient and binding to a lot of our you know minerals or, or metals to a very high affinity I mean, I just feel like a lot of it kind of gets sequestered in this film and, you know, with the research uh, for autism and they started using high dose nystatin and seeing all this goo and slime, you know, coming out of these kids. And so I think, uh, you know, we definitely need to understand some of that mechanism more. And in some ways, though, the, you know, then the big thing that we get into the biofilm, too, is this debate on how much do we want to disrupt it and something like Michael and I have talked a lot about is, you know, are we unleashing Pandora's box if we're just constantly trying to anti biofilm everything? Yeah, look, I think there needs to be a balance and um, you definitely, you know, you can go too far and just massively detoxing someone. And, mm -hmm. and another point I'll bring in at this point is that th there needs to be a balance between detoxing and building up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some patients you'll notice who are doing that sort of, um, a program of lots of detoxification, whether it be for mold and heavy metals and industrial chemicals. I mean, glyphosate was a huge topic mm. that came up in Denver and, and all of the different uh, problems that it causes. And so, mm. you know, you can, you can get right down the track of detoxing so many different compounds. Yeah. But, you know, also at the same time, we need to just have enough vitality as an organism mm -hmm. to be able to deal with any threat that comes along. We don't want to get so depleted Mm -hmm. in our body that we're sort of unable to just deal with the slightest bit of, you know, a tiny bit of cigarette smoke that for some reason catches us when we're walking down the street or something like that. We don't want to fall into a heap just uh, because we have an incidental exposure that we're not able to, to control, right? We want to have a level of vitality and resilience. And, of course, we mm -hmm. don't go seeking out someone who's smoking cigarettes, but sometimes you get exposures that you just can't. Right. You can't uh, control, right? You know, and we want to have that. Well, that's part of it as well as getting to that stage of resilience where, okay, maybe one day I, I did accidentally get some mold exposure through staying in a hotel room. But, mm -hmm. you know, I want to be able to to be able to withstand that and then be able to go back to my own home base, which is a sanctuary, 
and you know and be able to just gently detox that but i'm not so thrown off my my whole regimen that i'm i'm in bed for three weeks Mm -hmm. i'm so glad you brought that up and you you used a word that i've been like meditating on for a while which is you know resilience because you know um anybody that's working with that kind of demographic with the sirs and just you know lime mold all the nasty stuff it's such a grueling uh, process and it just goes on and on and on and there's you know the constant layers and you know something that seems to be kind of a contributing problem is we, we you know I, I love being a nerd and everything but we get so hard focused on the physiology and biochemistry that we're not always thinking about the psychology and, and the impact of psychology on the physiology and these uh, clients and patients it's very easy to get hyper neurotic and kind of hypochondriac. And it's like, there's no way that that more kind of fear response is going to be beneficial for the healing process. So I do, I, I like your point about we've got to have, you know, uh, physiological resilience and, you know, psychological resilience and still be able to like live our lives through the process. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, actually, a a more recent thing I've been thinking about quite a lot is what effect does a test have on Mm. on the patient? So so when a patient says, okay, shall we do a a urinary mycotoxin test? Sometimes I just directly ask, okay, when we get the result back, what effect do you think that's going to have on you? Mm -hmm. Is that going to, if you do see the mycotoxins, do you think that's just going to spur you on? To, okay, yeah, I need to do a heap of, of work on myself and I'll make these changes. Or do you think it's going to put you into more of a physiology of fear? Mm-hmm. And if, that, if that's what it's going to do, and if it's just going to trigger the panic buttons, is it that useful for you in this situation? Because mm-hmm. yes, you know, academically, yes, it's good to have that test. But it's a question of each patient and each situation at this moment. And if your best thing right now is just to tune into your body and maybe take four or five days off and going into the woods and camping and then coming back to your house, and that's going to be less panic inducing, well, maybe let's go that route because, you know, we've all got, we're, everyone's got to work in with the individual psychology of each client. And that's, that's a big thing that's been coming up for me recently. The more I've been getting into this mm-hmm. is, is slowly so you have all this academic framework, which is really, really interesting. And, you know, there's, there's all these tests that we could do in an ideal world um, or a world where it's needed. But in some cases, actually maybe doing less tests and just, you know, just tuning in to how do I feel when I'm in my house versus how do I feel when I'm away for a while and then contrasting them and then just, you know, just starting to develop that awareness um, through you know a, a number of exercises at the main at the same time maybe we could be doing some limbic system retraining mm-hmm. maybe we're also detoxing from EMF mm-hmm. maybe we learn to meditate at the same time you know there's a whole different there's a whole series of different options for people and I'm just going to throw that out there that the psychology of clients is really really important as part of the healing journey. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that's, that's really important for us to put on the table and discuss with our clients. Mm-hmm. Like, is this test going to be useful for you in terms of your psychology or, you know, is it going to send you into a bit of a spin? Let's have that discussion now. Yeah, I, uh, I, I really couldn't agree more. I'm in the midst of building this, this big course, which I don't know why none of my colleagues and friends told me how much a pain in the ass it is to build a course, but um, (laughs) I do, I have a whole module about uh, kind of the holistic model and psychology because it's funny, you know, when I first got into um, this field and, you know, went through like the FDN training and everything, at first I really thought like FDN was the same thing as functional medicine, but the more I've seen of this industry, Um, you know, it depends on the practitioner. That's at the end of the day, there's, there's no generalizations or stereotypes, but there definitely still is a lot of kind of reductionist thinking that seems like it's more common than not of, okay, well now instead of running conventional lab tests, we're going to run functional lab tests. Instead of treating the results with medications, we're going to treat the results with, uh, you know, supplements. And as you're saying, it's like, but what impact is that having on the real person? If we're you know, going to be doing individualized medicine, we have to individualize it and, and cater it to yeah. that individual and meet them where they're at. And like you said, I mean, mm. I think about, you know, I, I've got some plant children. I love my plant children. 
And it's like, you know, if, if talking to plants and, and loving on plants helps them grow, which I can attest to, um, you know, what does the fear response do when you're trying to, you know, overcome like a chronic illness like that? There's, so I love that you're, and that was something that, you know, when I first met you, um, really kind of caught my attention is, you know, not only are you an expert within the, the hard science, but you're still like a real dude and you're very aware and mindful of, of treating the whole person and, and using those critical thinking skills. Yeah, man, I, th I think it's so important. And I, I think just the fact that you really taking the time to understand a client properly mm -hmm. makes a huge difference. I mean, I think there's been studies just on the difference in healing between being heard properly mm -hmm. from a client and, and not having been heard. And, you know, we can do the same thing in functional, you know, in FDN or functional medicine just by saying, oh, yeah, 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 here you go. Here's your, here's your urinary microtoxin test. Here's your C4A test. Get out of here. Mm -hmm. but, you know, as you say, that's still <laughs> that's still pretty much a expression of, of allopathic thinking and behavior. But rather, if we sit and we really take the time to listen, I'm sure all the FDNs are doing this, but I'm just, just going over it again. Um, because, you know, you, you, when you get busy, it is possible sometimes to lose that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, it's something to be aware of. But if we really take the time to to listen to the depths of the story and sometimes listen to what isn't being said, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a real key. What isn't being said here but is being reflected in the body language? Mm -hmm. How can I, um, how can I um, bring that out to the surface a little bit more? And that that's, can be a really potent thing just to be sort of totally present to someone's story and say okay it really sounds like when you were mentioning about that part of your childhood that you, you didn't look comfortable could you tell me a little more mm -hmm. and sometimes there you go there's there's the piece right there that needed to be brought up and someone just needed to be give the willingness mm -hmm. for that to be discussed mm -hmm. right because sometimes people have a belief that, that that you know maybe i shouldn't talk about my trauma or maybe i shouldn't you know, I shouldn't mention what happened to me, but hey, it's the elephant in the middle of the room here, and elephants like to be talked about. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. <laughs> it's so true. And you have you ever had that feeling before, like you're you're doing a consultation and there's something that's not being said that's really yeah. obvious. Yeah. And you can keep walking around that elephant, and you know you can you know do a little dance around the elephant, but you know until you just say, hey, just just mentioning, there's an elephant sitting right in front of us here. Why yeah. don't we? Why don't we just bring a bit of attention to that? Oh, um, yeah. You know, there can, be, there can be a huge, a huge thing that just needs to be talked about, and and often that is trauma. I mm -hmm. found, you know, the place of trauma, and and there's definitely going to be a connection there, even though it hasn't been studied as yet. But you know, I've spoken with Ashok Gupta, my namesake, in London. I don't know if you know him. But he's got something called the Gupta Retraining Program, mm. and he says, you know, often. Yeah, often there will be a trauma around safety and so on in patients who've got problems with mold and multiple chemical sensitivity particularly. And so it's worth going back and also bringing a little bit of attention to that. So what has been the original trauma? Now, we're not saying that this is just a psychological problem caused by your belief that you're not safe. That's the other extreme. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we're saying there is, a, there is a real physical and physiological thing going on here, but there is also this susceptibility going on, this susceptibility. And now I'm moving more towards that idea rather than the idea of just you've got some genes and therefore you're susceptible, uh, right. which is really a very simplistic and reductionist approach. It's, it's more looking at what in your actual life has made you susceptible mm -hmm. to having this brush with mold on us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, you know, and this is uh, this is kind of stuff I live for, and what I think is the most interesting part of our field is that line between, you know, more the energetic, spirituality, psycho-emotional, and then the hard science, genetics, epigenetics, biochemistry. You know, it's getting very, very blurry, and that's what's cool is we're kind of thinning that line more and more because. You know, I, I like to look at everything through the lens of evolution of like, why would this sort of mech, you know, cell danger response that Bob Miller is, is doing some awesome work with? Like, why would this make sense from like an evolutionary perspective? I mean, if I'm a caveman, I'm walking into a dark, scary forest. I bet my body has this kind of intrinsic uh, knowledge that, hey, there's a threat in there and I better prepare my immune system for that. I better, 
you know, upregulate sympathetic activity. Um, and that's the thing, all the hard science in the world, it's like, well, I mean, a little bit of common sense. And, and that's the, that's kind of the thing is some of these, uh, I know I get a ton of clients and I'll, <laughs> I'll joke and say, you know, through Michael's website, because, you know, the kind of information Michael puts out there. And so I get these clients that are reaching out and like, well, I have, you know, sulfur. And it's, it's very, um, it's pretty neurotic. And meanwhile, they are, they're completely dancing around the psycho-emotional. And, you know, what is that trauma right, right. that could be contributing to the problem? And but I like how you said that where, you know, we're not at all saying, oh, this is just a psychology thing. But we have to really respect. Hey guys, it's Audrey, the Holistic Savage Podcast executive producer. How much are you guys loving this episode? I'm loving it so much. Well, if you are a functional practitioner that is interested in honing your skills on mold, microbes, and methylation for the betterment of your patients and your practice, well, make sure you guys check out this amazing offer that Metabolic Solutions and the Holistic Savage Podcast have put out there for you guys as a thank you. Uh, If you guys are interested in taking that masterclass, Make sure that you guys put in the offer code MOLDMASTER500, that is M-O-L-D-M-A-S-T-R 500, for $500 off their masterclass, only valid till 331 of 2020. Back to the power of psychology on the downstream physiology, um, you know, in regards to how this is going to affect our ability to heal from, you know, these extremely... um, toxic you know mold compounds and everything else yeah absolutely and then that that takes us to the discussion then how do we discuss what does this illness mean Mm -hmm. um how do we discuss you know what are the different feelings coming up and you know there's a couple of extremes of that as well and i guess what i'm going to going to propose is a bit of a middle way again so one one extreme view is just to say to the person, look, this is just your healing. This is you know, this is uh, this has all got meaning. You should be doing you know, this is your your spirituality coming out. This is the universe telling you that you need to pay more attention, man. And you know, while there could be a certain truth in that, we don't also want to dance over the fact that you know, there's a lot of panic here. This is actually the you know, your this is potentially the loss of your house, the the loss of stable finances for mm-hmm. you. This could result in the end of your relationship in some cases. That's not uh, uncommon because mm-hmm. of all of the emotions that that mold brings up. Uh, this could result in in major changes to your work life, etc. And uh, you know what we don't want to do is dance over the fact that there's a huge amount of panic here. There's a huge mm-hmm. amount of overwhelm going on here, and that's real. You know, you're not just making that up. We're not mm-hmm. saying that. Um, but on on the other hand, there is this other piece that there is a opportunity here. For, for growth, there's mm-hmm. an opportunity for you to to take all this in, all of this overwhelm, all of this panic, and actually integrate it and heal some of this original life trauma and move forward in the, in a in a psycho emotional growth type direction after this. And so both pieces are there, and I think that that's what I'm finding is the is the way forward in terms of of bringing bringing both sides into the equation just the simple fact that you know mold is super toxic it turns your life around um you know it's it's massively devastating with the other side that you know hey maybe there is a blessing here on one side of the of the picture as well mm-hmm. yeah i think you're i think you're so right and yeah uh, that's that's the hard part. One of my friends, um, you know, she's a ballistic psychologist type person. And it, it is, we always have to be asking, like, what's the story we're telling ourselves and looking at our belief system. But also, you know, we can't get like too far woo woo. Because as you said, like, yeah, there are times, you know, what do you, you know, I have a client in Egypt right now, uh, with a moldy home. And, you know, the remediation process, it's the whole thing is so faulty with the environmental testing. And is it there? Is it not? Is it growing? Is it not? Are there bio aerosols in the air? Is there not? How do you go about remediating it? Is it fully gone? You know, do you have spores all of your belongings and you move those belongings to a new house? Like it is a very in, you know, uh, attention to detail and it, it requires a certain amount of, you know, dilig- uh, diligence and meticulousness and uh, definitely it is going to stir up a lot of stress and people need to 
prepare, be prepared for that. And so that's where I love, you know, when you're educating practitioners and everything, you know, you're speaking to these concepts because um, I've heard a lot of other presentations just so focused on, okay, we'll put your binder in and do your, your mycotox tests. And um, then we're completely missing the mark. And we're almost like shooting ourselves in the foot for a really long, hard road. Yeah, man. Like as I say, that that side of it's there as well. I mean, there's there's no no getting away from that side, the physical side. That you know, yeah. if you've got a lot of mold toxins in your body, you're going to need some binders. You're going to get need to get away from water damage buildings. You're going to need to do some serious detox, whether that in, involves coffee enemas and saunas. But what you'll notice when you start doing all of that is what comes up: emotional trauma. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's all it's all linked. It's yeah. super linked, and you know, so. You know, there's a whole field now in, in what we call grounded spirituality, and, and, and there's actually a guy called Jeff Brown. Toronto has just re released a book, which is very, very interesting, called Grounded Spirituality, where he's, he's moving towards a paradigm of spirituality where we look at every facet of our life mm -hmm. uh, as, as being the grist for our mill of our spiritual growth. And, um, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of people, when, when you get mold, problems you know quite often some of the narratives that come up are like you know am i cursed mm -hmm. you know is is this the end of, you know am i just now um going to be in bed for the rest of my life is this mold illness going to be the the death of my life and there's a lot of really and this is from people who aren't particularly religious or anything it can be you know a real feeling that you know this has totally messed up my life and if we can just bring in a tiny little bit of an idea, you know, of, hang on, maybe there is this little bit of, of um, a hidden blessing here. Let's just accept mm -hmm. the possibility to start, to start with, no more than that. Mm -hmm. Just the, a little possibility that there could be a hidden blessing here if we work on this enough. And let's just go one moment at a time. And sometimes doing the mold illness made simple course is really good for people because it simplifies it all. People feel like, okay, hang on, I've just watched this eight-week thing and I, I know as much as I need to know now. Now I'm going to shut off the forums mm -hmm. and I'm going to yeah. you know, stop hearing the panic. And I, I know what I need to do now and really what I need to do is remediate my house, get onto some binders and, yeah, maybe maybe treat my nasal passages as well. I'm just going to focus on that for now. And you can see that can be a really, really good de-escalating process for people, just having a... a Pack, neat package of information that they're able to digest rather than just huge amounts of information. And, you know, on, on Facebook forums and so on, sometimes you have people saying things like, if you don't do X, you're going to be Y forever. Yeah. It's like a threat. It's like, yeah. a threat. <laughs> you yeah. know, if you, don't, if you don't do this perfectly, you're going to be damned forever. And, um, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing more triggering to the limbic system than that sort of statement. Actually. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're so right. And, you know, it's the, and part of it, too. It's like a lot, some of these people, you know, there's more uh, like, OK, they're actually in a, a water damage home. They're severely ill. Or, you know, I know like Neil kind of categorizes like class one, two or three. And you, know, you could have people like in wheelchairs and all sorts of messed up. And then there's kind of the more, you know, subclinical. And, and you know, certainly I, I think over the coming years, we'll see more and more you know, if, if people are looking for mycotoxins and mold as much as they're looking for stuff in the poop and parasites and all that, you know, I think they, they would see it super often because, you know, you see these people where um, even if they're not like super duper ill, you know, just more like kind of subclinical, like they just feel like shit and all the typical stuff, um, you know, and you'll see they, they've had uh, kind of this mycotoxicity or mycotoxicosis for years and years as these uh, all this junk has just been stuck in their bodies. And, you know, then you start uh, reverse engineering it of like, well, when did you notice you started feeling ill? And did you ever have water damage? And, you know, it's amazing to me how many times you end up making that connection. And so it's kind of this, uh, you know, the, this low grade chronic long term um, inflammation. I know I had this one lady in California uh, that exactly what I just described. And so then literally, okay, well, let's get like a little GI detox binder in there. And literally within a week, she's like, I feel so much better. And it's like, <laughs> okay, cool. So, but to your point, um, that's what happens though. Is some of these people just get so neurotic and they're just scaring the shit out of themselves by scouring the internet and uh, all the fear-based response. So, 
ah, man, it's, it's really just this never ending cycle. But I think this is why, you know, it's important to have these types of conversations um, and get this type of information out there. Absolutely. And, you know, and I think what you said about the gut microbiome and, you know, for, for, for quite a long time in the functional medicine movement, there was sort of two, three camps of practitioners. And there was one camp of practitioners who was pretty much saying, look, just get your diet and your microbiome right and everything else is going to sort itself out. Yeah. You know, and then there was the other camp who was saying, no, man, it's Lyme disease. You've yeah. just got to deal with the Lyme disease. Otherwise, you're just screwed. You're never going to get better. You know, there's a few different camps. And one was actually heavy metals, I think, and toxicity. You're just going to deal with those heavy metals. Otherwise, yeah. you're, you're screwed pretty much. Yeah. And I think now we're starting to see that it all comes together and really mold and biotoxin sort of sits in the center. Yeah. You know, it connects all these things like microbiome connects to mold. You know, Lyme disease is often connected to, to biotoxins and mold and, and heavy metals are often connected too. And when we have that more three-dimensional picture rather than all these disparate groups that actually all of these things are important and then you put in the psychology and the psycho-emotional piece it starts becoming a really nice three-dimensional piece that we're presenting here to people and if you start working with that you know as a, as a patient and try and not get too overwhelmed by all of the information that's yeah. out there and just start working at whatever level like maybe okay maybe my thing at the moment is i can just start doing coffee enemas and that's mm. it i yeah. can't really do much else at the moment maybe i don't have much money that's that's amazing too that's yeah. a huge step forward yeah if you start doing coffee enemas regularly you're going to get your liver creating a huge amount more bile and whatever mycotoxins or heavy metals or chemicals they're going to come screaming out and, you know, maybe just making sure you have some binders on board, but it doesn't have to be super expensive, right? Yeah. That's another thing that we can, that, you know, that's important to recognize. It doesn't always have to be that expensive. We can just start doing some simple things like that. We can clean up our diet. Maybe it's not organic to start with. You know, maybe we can't afford organic food, but mm -hmm. we can still, you know, for instance, take out sugar and take out grains, and that's not really costing us much more bring in some detox procedures and then let's say going camping for a week is something that I can do. I can't mm -hmm. afford a urinary mycotoxin test or quest or anything, but I can, I can do that. Right. And while I'm doing that, I keep up with my detox. I start doing some meditation and I'm starting to feel a level of, 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 of mastery over this. I'm starting to feel a level of um, reassurance that I know what I'm doing and I'm moving forward. Hey, that's great. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're still doing the program there. From my point of view, that's still FDN, mm -hmm. even though it's not the exact, you know, it's not the exact protocol that we'd usually do it, but it's still following the principles exactly. of, you know, taking away anything that's blocking that's blocking your body from returning to vitality. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're addressing all those things piece by piece and regaining vitality through this process. And that's really what we're all about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I absolutely love that because it is, it's that holistic model of let's, you know, let's shape the environment, let's shape our psychology, let's, um, you know, consistency, like literally I've got this little, you know, four week holistic lifestyle challenge thing going on right now. And something I was just ranting about in Facebook live is, you know, like gut health or detoxification, you know, we have to be thinking these things as a lifestyle, not a protocol. And I think it, it is this short term protocol mindset that screws people up. Of, well, let me do this, you know, very expensive, elaborate, sophisticated. And it's like, no, I mean, you know, you didn't you didn't get it's just like with gaining weight, losing weight. You didn't gain 100 pounds overnight. You're not going to lose it overnight. You have to change uh, the behaviors and the daily rituals. And, you know, over time, we say. You know, it's even if you are super duper toxic, you're not going to dump all these toxins in 30 days. They didn't accumulate there in 30 days. So yeah. or to your point, like, yeah, we have to be focused on the lifestyle behaviors that are conducive to the long term goal of healing, not just trying to do this intense crash course, and especially too, you know, they don't generally have the vitality. And you mentioned, you know, kind of the gut health and and I love that because um, you've been in this industry a lot longer than I have, but I've kind of noticed that it's like the different camps and people have like their thing. I'm saying, like, uh, it, it is kind of all centered. I like what you said about sort of the biotoxins sort of being in the middle because I think that's kind of how I've gotten really, you know, into this area and subject is, you know, it seems like the immunosuppression that happens with the, uh, the mycotoxins 
it seems like that is a big factor that's uh, that exacerbates everything else i mean you've got all the gut bugs or the lime or the metal but you know like considering mycophenolic acid is used for organ transplant rejection you know it's like Ooh. it's that immunosuppressive i i think uh you know that could be you know why this is such a, a you know fundamental thing or like neil always talks about how um you know 70 percent of the time the mycotoxins are kind of the uh, public enemy number one and it's like until we Ooh. get that situation under control how are we possibly going to get the you know co-infections under control as well yeah yeah well the gut or the heavy metals or whatever it might be mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. mm. so you mentioned yeah um, and that's oh go ahead yeah i was just gonna say so that's that's a big thing always that you know like let's say you have a patient you've been doing microbiome work with they're not getting better think mold got a Lyme disease patient they're not getting better think mold you got a heavy metal patient that's not getting better think mold it's just it's just such a huge key at this point in in our existence and and um, I'm not sure why that is the case but it, it seems to be a real hidden and and it, the other thing about it is it's very subtle I don't know if you've noticed that in a lot of cases it yeah. often doesn't come out straight away it's pretty rare that people say, yeah, I've been living in a massive thing. You know, I'm living in the, the place that was um, pictured in the movie Fight Club and there's water falling off the, the roof. And, right, right. You know, yeah, you know, there's not there's not, not much of that. You know, it's often often that, you know, my gut's not feeling that great and I've got something going on and you start working on that. And then it comes out, you know, maybe, maybe I was living in a moldy building about you know six seven years ago it was pretty bad maybe that comes out on consult number seven right mm -hmm. it's it's quite subtle sometimes you know and it's like oh, okay here we go mm -hmm. <laughs> this is something that hasn't come out yet yeah and so it is very subtle in subtle in that way that you know people often aren't aware of it in a very conscious way but i think what it is is people are unconsciously aware of it and often mm -hmm. when you build a level of rapport with them that right. they start becoming comfortable to just say anything mm -hmm. then that's often when they'll they'll start they'll start telling you about mm -hmm. it which is a really interesting thing it's an interesting phenomenon mm -hmm. you're so <laughs> right well and that's, that's what it it gets hard and uh i mean that's that's why i'm so passionate about what i'm doing these days cuz before you know it, I mean, even just this conversation, I, I really think sort of elucidates and speaks to the necessity for um, just like a next level type of practitioner that is putting it all together. Because, gosh, I mean, we're talking about like some in-depth psychological navigation and spiritual, but then the hard science as well. And it's like, there's not many, I don't know that many professionals that kind of put it all together. It's almost like, you know, with um, like in, in Reiki and kind of energetic medicine and stuff, it's all about, you know, holding a space, right? And, you know, whether you're a counselor or a Reiki practitioner or a functional medicine person, like we do have to get really damn good at holding a safe space for the client or patient to let that energy flow, whether, you know, that trauma and, and how that coincides with the toxicity. So, um, it's such a, and, and of course too, you know, the, the human nature is to always be looking externally, anything to avoid, you know, looking within and facing those hard inner traumas. And so there's a lot of projection of, you know, like, well, I'm really relying on you, Mr. Practitioner to get me well. Um, and it's like, Ooh, we're going to have to reframe that belief system if we're going to get anywhere. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. My friend, actually, I have a good friend here who lives in L.A. He does acting workshops. And he said one thing that comes up quite a lot for people now is that, you know, he tells people, look, you know, you're, you're writing this, this script or you're writing this film. And um, if it's not all coming out, you know, you're going to just allow the time for, you know, for the for the processing to go on. And, and he says that the reaction he gets from a lot of people these days is, look, I'll give this a go for one hour. And if I don't do it, if I can't get there in one hour, then screw it. I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> and <laughs> he, he thinks it's, it's, it's just a, a real modern phenomenon that people, you know, particularly in the U.S., we're so time focused. Just and, and sometimes we can think like that. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna deal with this mold illness for six weeks. If I don't get there, then, then screw it. I'm going to I'm going to go to a conventional doctor and get antidepressants. Yeah. But that's not gonna that sort of thinking is not gonna get you anywhere. 
right. what I'm trying to raise. That right. sort of thinking is, is not going to help. There's no time limit for healing. Mm-hmm. And, and the key is you, if you put a lot of time pressure on, on your healing journey, what that's going to do is, is get in the way of your, your subtle perceptions from picking up what's really going on. Mm-hmm. And yeah, maybe you wanted to do something in a few months' time. Maybe you wanted to start college in a few months' time, or maybe you wanted to start a business, or whatever. But hey, you know, life has got other things to say right now, mm-hmm. and you know, it may just be that you're just going to put that aside and give this healing journey the time mm-hmm. that it it needs and it require it demands. In fact, the healing journey demands a certain amount of time from you to to um, to engage with it. Mm-hmm. properly mm-hmm. so as that you know the healing journey and you together are having a partnership here mm-hmm. i think that's a one way of looking at it mm-hmm. and you know there's amazing little little insights that can come up through that so i'm just going to throw that that little concept out there as well that there's no time limit for healing mm-hmm. and i really want to discourage people from putting time limits on it oh totally i i really like that you know you've got a respect the process and and that's what's fun of kind of being you know with my background as I started as a personal trainer and all that and it's like you know same thing with weight loss like you've got to respect the process of like it, it's going to take time and you can't all right well I'm going to do a 90 day weight loss program and you know like it's up to my trainer to make it happen and if it doesn't work then and it's like it's just it's not the it's not the right attitude or belief system to get anywhere in healing it never ends, but that, that is where they're, like you said earlier, of uh, if we can find that kind of silver lining and, and look at it as like a little bit of a blessing in disguise, because if you're present enough to learn the lessons that, you know, the universe or whatever is trying to teach you, you can really learn a lot through the illness and through the healing journey. And that's, you know, it has to be looked at that way, but um, yeah, getting some deep stuff here. Yeah, man, it's great. I love it because this is stuff that often, often doesn't get talked about at, at in, in mold conferences and so on. But I think it's so key, really. These are like the cliff notes of, mm-hmm. of mold illness, if you like. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's, there's different things. I'm, I'm not particularly religious, but if you take the idea from Neil Donald Walsh that, that God is always talking to you, mm-hmm. take that idea as well. And um, whether you like to call it God or whether you, you prefer not to use the name God, whether you just like to use the universe, that's cool. It's, it's, it's not about a religious belief. Here. Mm-hmm. But if you take the idea that the universe or life even, life is always talking to you, yeah. then, take, take, then ask the question, get intensely curious. What is this illness trying to say to me? Mm-hmm. What is this life experience trying to say to me? Um, is there something I have missed along the way here? Or is there something I need to to pay attention to here that kind of curio- intense curiosity mm-hmm. creates a mindset which can be very beneficial as well where you're really totally engaging while the opposite of that is the resistance mindset mm-hmm. so you know and i started talking about that when i brought in the idea of time limits because basically time limits are a form of resistance mm-hmm. so if you're in this idea look I, i'm going to do this but See the big but, that's the elephant in the room right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to do this, but I want, I want to start college in two months. Yeah. And you better have me better. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> you know, I want to do this, but, but if it costs me any more than $333.33, mm-hmm. then screw it. I'm out of here. All of these conditions, you know, you don't want to make a conditional contract with life. Right. You want to really, <laughs> you know, you want to you want to just ask it the question: What are you, what are you giving me? Here? You know, what are you trying to tell me here? And um, you know, rather than okay, let's say you do have some restrictions. Let's say they're financial restrictions. What you want to do is rather than put that as a big but in the middle of the equation, you want to more ask the question: Okay, how can I do things in a way which is less straining financially, but still allows me to fully engage with the healing process. Mm-hmm. And you see, that's, a, that's a, again, engaging fully with it rather than putting resistance in there. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is another really key thing is asking yourself always, always this question, how much am I engaging, how much am I resisting the process? Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's not going to be 100% and it's not going to be – it's a fluid process. Sometimes you may go – Okay, today I'm just not not feeling it, yeah. you know, and maybe I am resisting it. You know, that's that's yeah. cool too. Yeah, that's that's fine too. You know, and you just just you know, 
noticing that, acknowledging that, that's all good. You know what? Today's maybe not my day to do anything too much on the healing journey. And maybe maybe once in a while I just need to tune out and watch a movie. That's a, that's fine. Mm-hmm. You're not saying that that it's about being perfect. And, you know, sometimes just having that conscious process of saying to yourself, okay, I'm going to you know, take off on, a, on, a, on um, this journey of watching a movie and having a little break from the intensity of this, but then I'm going to get right back on my journey afterwards. And see, that's that also presents a very different um, energy to just getting distracted and unconsciously getting thrown off and just getting distracted into other things. Mm-hmm. And if you if you just managing the process yourself and say, okay, I'm going to allow myself to go into that for a while, but then I'm going to come back to engaging again. It's quite a useful thing. And you have some people having a little clock face or some some kind of diagram where they're, they've got written out how much am I engaging and how much am I resisting. Mm-hmm. That can be a, a quite an interesting little exercise mm-hmm. um, for, for them, the, the spiritual side, if you like, or the the, the self-development side of, of, of the healing journey. Absolutely. Well, and this, is, this is why, you know, I think it, it is going to take kind of a, a new, you know, age of uh, practitioner and everything. Cause I think the, you know, the, the functional from the, the client patient perspective and then the practitioner side, you know, functional medicine is such a seductive concept on paper you know, if like, oh, you're going to run some labs, then you'll know exactly what's wrong. You'll build a fancy protocol. I do it for 90 days and, you know, all, all is well. And, um, you know, unfortunately too, I think a lot of practitioners, uh, are just trying to survive in business, you know, uh, and you know, if they're lacking the experience and then they're not going to be, they're just going to take that client. Sure. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's how it works. Like, here we go, you know, um, and they're not going to have those honest conversations, but and, you know, something you see a lot is what's hard about it is, you know, exactly everything you're talking about and we're discussing in, on this uh, on this episode. I mean, this is the kind of stuff they need to hear because what a lot of them, these patients do is they just bounce from practitioner to practitioner of like, yeah, you know, I didn't like what Dr. Deep said. He made it sound like I was going to have to do all this, you know, psycho spiritual work. And, you know, I just want a protocol, damn it. And it's like, uh, well, I mean can't save them all i guess (laughs) (laughs) yeah that's it and you know i guess yeah so this whole healing journey for the practitioner as well i guess is what you're starting to touch on and you know that one of the big Mm -hmm. things is surviving and having a, a flourishing business but you know and and the emotions that come up with that for a practitioner often do relate to a degree of fear and, you know, so also it's, it's interesting to actually, as a pr- practitioner, observe yourself. What sort of emotion do you get when you, let's say, you get an inquiry email from a patient who's not quite on the right wavelength? Do you mm-hmm. feel that sense of inner pressure to have to acquiesce to them mm-hmm. because you want your business to be successful? Or are you able, or you, you kind of got to the stage now where you say, okay, yeah, I do feel that, but on the same level, I'm going to to try to do what I think this person really needs to hear or to try and communicate what I believe you know, is going to be really helpful for this person. Uh, you know, there's one practitioner, Jennifer Ellis, uh, mm. or whatever her name is, yeah, yeah. Yeah, who, who really who has really brought that out in a lot of, of depth where, you know, it's just the idea of, you know, what can I best, how can I best give this person um, what they need to hear right now. And sometimes we don't know. I mean, we're not going to always act. Sometimes we, and I'll put that concept out there, that sometimes you do need to ask more questions, I think. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important rather than jump into an assumption about what's going on with someone. Yeah. yeah, and and I think that's often a really good thing. And you know what? So again, we we're going back to this idea of the middle way again. So as I say, yeah. someone sends in a thing saying, "Hey, can you cure me in ninety days?" And you know, for my hashing protocol. Or whatever. Let's say that's an example, right? Yeah. And you can feel that part of you. You know, so one extreme is to go, "Oh yeah," you know, functional medicine is the next generation of healing or whatever, you know, there's part of you that wants to go with that program, right? Yeah. Which is like a sales pitch yeah. almost. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then maybe there's another, and then there's another part of you maybe, which wants to say, look, look, man, you just, you haven't, you know, you obviously haven't understood functional medicine and, you know, you're not going to get anywhere with that kind of attitude, and, you know, and, and give them a really sharp backlash. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I, I'm thinking sometimes that the, the wisdom is, is just sailing in the middle there. 
yeah. and just going, okay, let me ask you a few more questions. Tell me about who have you seen so far and what has led you to, to, to thinking that this is the approach you need to take. And let's tease this out a little further. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they'll come back with some other really important information. And, you know, sometimes it'll end up that they do still come to you as a practitioner or sometimes not but you've really properly engaged and listened. And I think that in and of itself is a really important uh, service that you're doing to that person and and actually to the whole functional medicine world because you're taking the time to define what we are properly to them mm-hmm. rather than taking a quick quick approach on either side of the, of, of the coin, mm-hmm. you know, by either just giving them a backhand or just, you know, giving them a sales pitch. Totally. Totally. That's, you know, that's where I've, you know, it's been learning curve for me too over the years. Uh, you know, and I've, I've adapted the language you mentioned, um, Jennifer and she, she does, she does a really good job with that of being very upfront and honest. And, um, it's how you have to, cause otherwise you're just shooting yourself in the foot when, you know, your patient's clients aren't getting great results and they get grumpy at you and, oh, well, you know, maybe it's retroviruses and, you know, you just, there's always another layer to that onion and, you keep yeah. going down the rabbit hole of science and meanwhile, completely overlooking um, the process. And we have to, you know, I mentioned respecting the process earlier. And I was thinking about, you know, as I've studied just like the basic biology of mold and it's like, you know, it's, it's a fungi is its own kingdom. You know, it, it's fungi has been on this planet longer than humans have by, you know, who knows how long. So it's a, highly sophisticated uh organism that's been you know programmed through countless years of evolution so i think it's a certain amount of um you know respect that we have to have for nature and um something i you know some like research that i hope happens or i hope to make happen i don't know yet is you know looking at uh, it'd be interesting to see you know i'm thinking of like you know these different control groups and looking at um, like all the different cytokine responses of like, okay, you know, the mycotoxins present and, um, you know, looking at whatever kind of treatment, but then also like the limbic system stuff and kind of psychoemotional work. And, you know, how are we altering, um, you know, cytokine signaling or kind of the, uh, the immunity response to, um, the illness, but, you know, there's so many variables there. That's like, gosh, that would be, hard research to really map out. Yeah, I think I think research is tricky in this area, as you say, because there's so many different variables. And and one thing about research is you we're only looking at one thing at a time. But mm-hmm. I think if we start getting enough research out there, so we talked about, you know, perhaps a study I'm doing with Emily on IV vitamin C and oxalates, I think it would be really, really great to get some more study on on fungus and oxalates and mast cells mm-hmm. and really just start to get some a little bit more elucidation out of some of these mechanisms and and you know dr shoemaker's definitely paved the way with some of his seminal work on crs but i think there's a lot of building we can do on that as a a movement a functional Mm -hmm. medicine movement and um you know slowly slowly that that will help um to to build our knowledge base but at the same time as you're saying not still not going a hundred percent just down the the reductionist path it's it's like you know we're always three-dimensional beings you know we've got that side of ourselves that's you know the investigator you know and many practitioners are in that kind of archetype Mm -hmm. you know we're investigators we want to look at things more we want to always think of new answers maybe someone sends us an email we think ah there we go that's retroviruses Mm -hmm. but we want to always take into account okay yes maybe that is there but let's also look at the other side what's just what's this the common sense thing going on here with this person Mm -hmm. what's the desperation i hear in their voice Mm -hmm. where's that coming from what is that where where are they really at in their in their healing journey now and how can i best support them or not support them i mean i do think sometimes the best thing you know for some practice for some patients or, or clients rather is, is just to say, no, I can't help you. And that can definitely happen. You know, you know, that, that definitely is part of it. But I, you know, after having heard them out properly, usually I think is the best thing. And, you know, if they have that, that feeling of, of having being heard and then they hear what you have to say, usually it's quite obvious, you know, in mm-hmm. those cases where you're just not a match, yeah. you know, it, it, you know, there doesn't necessarily have to be a big rejection there. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. 
Very cool. So you mentioned, uh, I think on Facebook, something about some new kind of discoveries regarding like iron metabolism hijacking or something like yeah. that. What's that about? I'm curious. Yeah. Okay. You're opening up a Pandora's box here, but <laughs> good way to, good way to <laughs> maybe wrap up on like a nerdy note or something. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's throw that in. And that was one of the things in the Denver conference is that with certain patients and clients, you know, there's, there can be um, other triggers of inflammation. And that's a, just a, a really important thing to keep in mind. And in some cases, it's, it's the, the problem is they've got too much iron in the system. Mm. And what's happening is the iron is actually feeding bugs in the body and mm-hmm. feeding inflammation in the body. And, you know, some, some other people, it can be glutamate, uh, can be mast cell issues. There's all sorts of other different possibilities. But just to throw the iron one in there for a second, and the most classic thing is it's going to be people of, of English, Welsh, Irish, or Ashkenawi Jew descent mm. um, who have this, you know, there's a certain gene around iron which is called HFE. And that, that's generally the most significant one. And then those people tend to absorb too much iron from their food and they'll tend to to have iron levels that are, that are excessive and tending to sequester, is the term we use, into the tissues and feed inflammation. And so it's just always something to think of. And there are some tests you can do. Um, so one of them is called seroloplasmin mm-hmm. and in red blood cell magnesium, there's mm-hmm. some things you can look at. And if you've got a real low seroplasmin below, well below 35 to 45, that's often going to be a sign yeah. that that you're not you're, ha- you're not holding iron in the right places. And if you've got the low red cell magnesium to go along with that, you know you don't have enough magnesium to properly hold the iron. Mm-hmm. So these are just uh, it's just another little thing that you can have there in the back of your mind. And especially it's going to be much more of a problem in men than women. Uh, particularly in the in the premenopausal range, because women are, are donating blood every month, mm-hmm. um, which is mm-hmm. a, a amazing little little arrangement of nature. And actually, some authors have speculated that's why women may may live longer mm. than men because mm. of that because of that natural mm. tendency to 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 lose lose blood and lose iron. So anyway, for some people, just to throw that out there, the the, the simple thing may be that donating blood regularly for some guys, and often the you know you'll see these guys who have quite a reddish complexion to them, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you know who are of English, they're going to be often the ones who have too much iron. Mm-hmm. Um, and and yeah, if they if if you can check that out, and if, particularly if their ferritin is higher and transferrin is higher, you, you're starting to think, and it may not fit into the medical model of, of you know hemochromatosis or anything mm-hmm. like that. You know, we know that these things can be subclinical, but if you see the they're trying to uh, they're starting to head up in the ferritin levels and low seroplasma, you might suggest, yeah, just why don't you see if you can donate some blood, see mm-hmm. how you feel after that. And some people it's like, whoa, yeah. I donated blood and actually I'm actually feeling a lot better now. There's something, you know, some kind of uh, inflammatory thing has, has gone away now. Mm. And so that's a, just another little, that's just another little side piece that we can always think about um, in patients who are inflamed and it's not settling down. Mm-hmm. And there can be an interplay between iron and mold or iron and Lyme disease or, or, you know, all sorts of different triggers of inflammation. So just another little thing to, to keep in the back of your head there, and particularly for those subtypes, you know, males um, who are, are more from the English, Irish, Welsh, Ashkenazi Jew um, background and maybe who have a reddish complexion and maybe, maybe the that will be a drinkers as well tend mm-hmm. to be more susceptible to, to mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, the mm-hmm. archetype I'm thinking of. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like the, uh, yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The tradesman sit, sit, sitting at the bar, having his beer red in the face. Right. Hey, right. That's yeah. when, that's when you might think to yourself, Hey, maybe this guy needs some blood. Yeah. Got the <laughs> iron, got the histamine, yeah. just got all, all the things. Yeah. You know, you always hear like, yeah. uh, well, I guess not always, but with, the nerdy friends I have, I always hear, you know, iron is like chocolate to bugs or something like that. And yeah, um, yeah, yeah I think that there's it. probably a lot of truth to that. And you see different, you know, cause I always, I always make sure I always do a, a nice blood chem panel with every, you know, round of kind of functional testing I'm doing. Cause I, I like to try to look at that. I think, you know, one thing that's exciting is with, um, you know, machine learning technology that we have these days, I think that'll be the next big kind of uh, technological breakthrough is then we can, 
you know, use machine learning to kind of pull this data on different demographics of like, okay, well, we see this. Uh, and then what are we seeing with, oh, how many of them are, you know, having these weird iron aberrations or um, whatever it is. So, uh, you know, that'll be kind of the next frontier is because like as a practitioner, you know, you're, we're trying to think of all these thousands of variables in our head all the time. And it's just like it gets so blurry and so complicated so quick. So that's where I do think the machine learning will allow us to, um, you know, identify patterns that we otherwise probably would never have been able to. Yeah, absolutely. And you could say on, on one side of the coin, as a practitioner, you kind of are a computer. Yeah. You're, you know, you, and that, that's worth acknowledging that, you know, there's one side of you that's just processing data and putting that into your 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 knowledge base and, and then spitting out an answer. And then the other side of that, you're not a computer at all. Okay, mm -hmm. you're a living, breathing, you're a living, breathing human, which is interacting with the client and coming up with with thoughts. So it's a really interesting, and that, I guess that's one of the big themes that's come out of this conversation, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That you know that everything is three dimensional. Yeah, you know, we're a computer on one side, and then on the other side, we're a hugely intuitive being. Yeah, who can pick up all sorts of things that have never been discussed before. And sometimes sometimes you'll get cases which have been seen by the best top um, practitioners around the country, you know. Sometimes they've been to 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 Dr. Super Duper. Yeah. And they come to you. And you come to you and sometimes you'll think, well, how am I going to help this case? What have I got to contribute here? Mm -hmm. I mentioned this in Denver, actually. But I think one of the keys is to remember, hey, I am a unique human being with unique right. perceptions. Yeah. And I'm I'm just going to, to be present, as present as possible here, and see what comes out. And, you know, sometimes I've been very surprised at what things come out, even after patients have seen the best. Mm -hmm. Because you don't know if the best person was having the best day when they yeah. saw that client. Yeah. You know, it's it's that's it. You just don't know what was going on that day. Maybe the best guy is now in the in the program of of being the best mm -hmm. and is no longer present anymore. Yeah. So, and you, the you know the 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 humble FDN practitioner, may just be able to tune in and and put that piece in that's being missed because the other practitioners, for whatever reason, weren't able to be present. And totally. so, you know, we are we are really amazing beings. I want to I want to probably throw that in at the last point here. Yeah. You know, and the, we do we do have the ability to to really help people if we fully show up. Mm. I want to really put that out there that, you know, yeah. this this concept of showing up, showing up to every case and just being aware of our own programs that, you know, sometimes, it's, you know, the the um, the self-deprecating program can come in or what am I going to be able to add to this case or or the other one coming in? Oh, geez, you know, maybe this this person is going to be too draining on me. And, you know, I, I don't want to I don't think you should ignore any of these little um, narratives or feelings. Mm. But at the same time. You know, after having given them a bit of time, try and just totally show up for the client and just yeah. see what in this moment you guys can pick up. You know, and sometimes, a, you know, a client who's really doesn't seem to be open, you just say that one thing at the right time mm -hmm. and putting it works for some reason. And that's it's a mystery why the, those sorts of things happen. But um, I just want to bring this enthusiasm back at the last moment to this practice of FDN because yeah. it really is it really is an amazing art and it's a very human art yes. and we have the ability to to practice that in a way that medical doctors don't. Yes, and I, and that's really cool. I totally agree. Yeah, I love that you everything you just said and um, you know like I, I'm a young dude and and probably in some people's eyes like a little bit of an up and comer and I've had to you know, fortunately through my own spiritual practice, I feel like I've been able to continuously show up, but yeah, you know, what you just said kind of is almost like the journey of my year. Cause I've had, um, multiple clients come to me this year from like Klinghart's clinic. And of course it's like, whew, you know, I'm a 27 year old dude doing my thing. And it's like, I've got these complex people from Klinghart and it's like, but that's exactly, I'm like, well, you know what? Like, screw that, Brendan. Like, well, why are you going to tell yourself in this imposter syndrome and all that. And it's like, show up like you, I, and I love that. And that's something I try to drill into people's heads is everybody has their own 
unique divine power and gifts. And, you know, we have to look inwards. We have to identify that, believe in it, cultivate that, uh, you know, and we expand our aura, our energetic field. And, um, you know, sometimes that can be the biggest thing. But like you said, we just got to keep showing up every day and, you know, lead with love yeah. and do our best. So, you know, I yeah, tell you what, Doc, Dr. Deep, this has been an amazing conversation. I, I definitely consider you you know, one of my uh, kind of go-to role model mentor dudes within this space, because I think you really do uh, a, an amazing job of putting it all together with hard science, spirituality, the, the human piece, though. Um, so I, I think you've got an amazing uh, mind and heart and soul for this. And, you know, it definitely uh, speaks to uh, to your success and everything. So thank you so much for joining me. Absolute pleasure, man. And uh, it's been a really, really cool conversation and look forward to having more in future. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll look forward to the next one. I'm sure we'll cross paths uh, again one of these days and I'll definitely look forward to it. We'll stay in touch in the meantime. All right, man. And I'll just enjoy the rest of my three days here at FDN HQ in San Diego. <laughs> that sounds awesome. We'll enjoy it. Tell Rita said hi and uh, I'm sure we'll talk soon, my friend. All right, brother. Thanks so much. All right. We'll see you.